says we're live. We're live. Nice. <laughs> hello, hello. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the ZK, ZK Sync Weekly Rollup. Happy Friday, everyone. It's always a, a mystery sometimes with the with OBS. So, all right, yeah. let's go live. Ooh, sorry, I had the the, the YouTube page of oh, open yeah. time. I was like, hmm, I'm hearing quite the same thing. Happy <laughs> Friday, everyone. <laughs> um, welcome to the Z, uh, ZK Sync Weekly Rollup. Um, it's always great to be here with you. We have some people already saying hi. Hello, everyone. Um, Today, we're lucky to have Encore with us, uh, CFO at Matter Labs. Um, I think with our hey friends, we're going to start um, we start our small chat and small conversation with Encore. Welcome, Encore. Thanks for having me, guys. So exciting to be here with the community. Thank you. I'm sure they're very excited as well. If you have any questions um, during the conversation um, with Anchor or you want to ask a specific question, um, just feel free to drop them in the comments on the YouTube live stream. Um, we're going to keep on monitoring there. Or so you can write on Discord and we can keep an eye there as well. Um, Anchor, welcome to the ZK Sync Weekly Rollup. Uh, we tried two weeks ago to make that happen, but uh, for unforeseen event, we couldn't make it. We're happy to have you this week. Um, it again, uh, thank you very much uh, for that opportunity. I wanted to ask you a few questions about your, your background, about your position at Matter Labs as CFO, um, to, to tell about, uh, your, your background to the community. So, um, my first question I had for you was, um, could you introduce yourself to the community, give a little bit um information about your past experience and how did you end up as um at matter labs as a chief financial officer wow yeah where to begin and again <laughs> apologies for not being able to join you guys a couple of weeks ago as you guys know we have just closed our series c run a uh, big announcement that week and i had a flood of questions and meetings with investors and banks and I just couldn't make it happen. So apologies for that to you guys and the community, but I'm excited to be here today. And no yeah. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, my journey, you know, it's it really began in um, Cornell when I was finishing up my MBA. Um, I was there for my two year MBA program. And, you know, during the last semester, you usually take some courses just to finish up your credits. I decided, because I came from a computer science engineering background, I decided I'm gonna take disruptive technologies, which was you know, being offered during that time. And I remember the first day in the course, the professor walked in, he goes bitcoin.org on the board. And then he tells everybody to install that software on our computers. And then through the next three months, wanted us to basically mine bitcoins on our laptops. And this was you know, back in 2010. So I, I kind of got introduced through that through that course. And then in three months, I think, you know, I kind of mined maybe like close to 30 Bitcoins at the time on my old HP laptop. And then fast forward <laughs> to, you know, my my career in, in Wall Street. I was working at American Express downtown Manhattan. And this is like now 2013. And somebody from that class called me up and, and he goes, hey, Ankur, have you been following what Bitcoin's doing? I said, I don't know. And then he says, go online and check the, the price of Bitcoin. So I do that and I see it's now at $1,000. And then he asks me, do you have the laptop that you know we used to mine the Bitcoins back at Cornell? I said, no, that was an old HP laptop, the hard disk crashed, oh. and I threw it away, you know, because I already had two laptops by then, one from American Express where I was working and a new one that I purchased. So that was sort of my beginning going down that rabbit hole because as a computer science engineer having been exposed to that technology that early and then not realizing that i should have at least taken that hard disk out or used you know a usb drive or something to basically take the private keys off of it was was stupid right and i let it crash and then i did not even try to to keep the hard disk so i could salvage it later so that was that was a really a big moment a pivot in my life where i realized I was a computer science engineer. 
I was at Cornell exposed to this technology and I still missed it. I still did not understand the actual blockchain technology and how it works. So I started really focusing on that. And then that took me to, you know, a course at MIT, which was focused on blockchain and e-commerce. Um, I did that course in 2016. And meantime, while I was working at American Express, then I was working at Citigroup, again, in New York City. I was also doing these meetups with a lot of these little groups that had formed through that course that I did online at MIT and then through people in my network. And I realized there was a genuine interest to learn more about what this technology is. So I was doing these meetups in hole in the wall, you know, places in New York City. And then my wife and I decided we had had enough of the city. And also personally, I wanted to move to the West Coast where the de development of blockchain technologies and, and you know, e-commerce was happening much more rapidly. So we moved to LA and in LA, I started running some blockchain meetup groups in Silicon Beach. And I was also, you know, doing the same thing in San Francisco. And that's when Kraken reached out to me um, in, you know, 2019, summer of 2019. And Kraken said, hey, you know, looks like you're really involved in the space. You have some good background um, in finance, but also in technology. Would you like to come help us, you know, join the finance team? So Kaiser, who was the CFO at the time, he is now the, the SVP and CFO at Binance.com. He hired me as the first hire on the finance team. Uh, back in 2019. It was still a bear market, right? The pandemic hadn't hit. Pandemic came right after that in March 2020. It was a pretty scary time. And then the entire bull run started, right, as the halving happened. So it's uh, it's it's been a crazy journey since then. But, you know, Kraken was really my professional entrance into the industry as the head of finance, FPNA, strategic finance. And then we hired people, obviously, to help me out. And then, you know, we had a head of a strategic finance and we were really working together well. But I realized at an exchange, you're really not sort of close to the actual projects that are, you know, building on top of the blockchain, which was the reason I got into it in the first place. So earlier this year, you know, I started thinking about what's next. I was talking to a few different companies. Um, there was a, a Bitcoin mining company called CoinCloud. Um, there was the, the company called Drive Digital, which is the digital assets arm of Drive Wealth, which provides equity solutions to a lot of startups and other traditional companies. And then there was a blockchain gaming company called Pocketful of Quarters. All three were, you know, fantastic companies. I spoke with the, the team there. I interviewed for the CFO position. I was fortunate enough to get those CFO offers. But it still did not feel like I was I was doing what I really wanted to do. So I walked away from those offers very humbly. And Matter Labs reached out to me just, you know, a few months ago. And, um, you know, I, I was following the zero knowledge proof development. I knew about it. I genuinely understood sort of the technology behind scaling the Ethereum blockchain. And Matter Labs was something I had been looking at even when I was at Kraken. So, you know, it, it just seems like this, this amazing ethos, amazing ecosystem. And then I started talking to the team here. I spoke with Steve Newcomb, our chief product officer. I spoke with Alex, our CEO. I spoke with Zoe, our COO. And I just felt like this was the right place to be. So I, I jumped on board. I was amazing. Wow, what a, what a journey. Uh, starting from losing custody or losing it, uh, your Bitcoin to to matter lives. That was a, that's a impressive. And what I like about your background is that not only you, uh, well, you have a very strong background in finance, but you're also a core the core computer scientist. Uh, you're someone that is able to bridge these two worlds, understand the yeah the and you come also from you have seen Wall Street traditional finance, so you have such a broad background that allows you to bring all these words from, from computer science to finance and then uh, metalized and decentralized finance. That is a right fascinating journey. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I, I honestly believe a lot of my network now, a lot of my friends and colleagues in the beginning when they saw me doing these things, taking the course at MIT, moving to, to the West Coast, they were skeptical, obviously. They were like, <laughs> you're basically betting everything on this industry. And, and you guys remember when the 2017 ICO crash happened. You know, I was part of that. I was part of the Mount Gox collapse. I was, you know, one of the account holders on, on Mount Gox uh, in 2013. So it, it was a journey of a lot of hardships, to be honest. Every time that I tried to get into it more, 
I sort of felt like I was I was taking more setbacks. You know, Mount Gox was 2013 because, as I said, when I realized I had lost my bitcoins on my computer, I started purchasing bitcoins on Mount Gox. Luckily, I didn't have that much money at the time to buy too much bitcoins, so I didn't lose. <laughs> I didn't lose that much. I took it out before the collapse happened. But I don't know if you guys know the story, but Kraken, Jesse Powell, the reason Kraken started was because of the Mount Gox collapse. So when back then. Um, Mark Karpolis, who was who was the guy who was running the exchange, he you know had some issues with the exchange. Obviously, when this this hack happened, and the team over there, including Roger Beer, they actually reached out to Jesse and asked him to come down and help. So he flew over to Hong Kong, and they sat there for a few days to try to figure out what was going on. And then Jesse said, "Look, I I truly believe if Mongox collapses and we don't have a way out for our customers here." It's basically going to be a really bad thing for the industry because that was the only single exchange at the time and people would have lost a whole amount of trust. So he started cracking to help out those customers that were impacted by Mongox collapse. And even today, Kraken is actually paying out as a custodian to those customers. So from the trustee to the customers, Kraken is the intermediary now. So I, I had been following Jesse on Twitter and other things. And, you know, I saw his stance on not operating in New York because New York started the bit license. And Jesse was, you know, very against, you know, those kinds of policies and very libertarian. And I think the, the whole ecosystem around crypto has evolved a lot, especially now with the things that have been happening in the market, with the FTX collapse and Sam Bankman fried saying the things he's saying. We should not forget how we started, right? I mean, there's a whole lot of precedence in the, the aspect of building for the world, for the masses. That is the ethos that we have in the crypto community. And Matter Labs and ZK Sync, as you guys know, our mission is to drive the mass adoption of crypto forward. So really focusing on the technology and the right things, instead of focusing on a few people who might have entered the space because of greed, because of ego, because of gaining power, we should just be like, you know, we are the people who are going to drive this industry forward, not some of these bad actors who can who can come and go. And that has always happened, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like I, your story is so interesting because like, as I'm saying, like you, you were in like the trenches with everybody, like starting out and like you've made this journey and to getting from seeing like the Wall Street to uh, crypto. I'm very interested to, especially as you talk about what's happened in the last few months, like where do you personally see uh, crypto and traditional finance going in the future? Does does one take over the other? Do they work uh, like in, like hand in hand together? Uh, what what do you kind of see from your perspective and your experience, uh, the direction that everything's going? Yeah, that's, that's a very, very good question. Um, I mean, when you think about the way things have evolved, right? When... Bitcoin started, it was a white paper, right? And and Satoshi Nakamoto was an online anonymous person or a group of people, we still don't know. But when you think about it, at the core of everything, it's the technology that was driving the interest, right? I mean, it, it, it isn't the case that cryptography and you know cypherpunks weren't there before Bitcoin, that there's been a whole slew of people who were always there in the industry. I think what really took um, the world by storm was the fact that people started realizing for the first time ever, you have something that can actually disrupt traditional financial services, right? And my interest was driven through that experience when I was at American Express and then at Citigroup and then in LA at MUFG Union Bank. MUFG Union Bank, by the way, is part of the Mitsubishi Group, which is the largest bank in Japan. And when I joined Mitsubishi, um, I was actually part of their US team in LA. But what I realized was in Japan, they were already building a blockchain internally um, and they were going to launch their own token. So remember, some of these banks, some of these traditional financial services companies were actually pretty much involved from the beginning. They were always there. They saw the potential. They wanted to get involved. But here's the difference, right? What happens is in traditional services, you have a lot of regulatory and compliance requirements. And in order to navigate those for a traditional bank, it's exponentially harder than it is for a new startup to come up and have a have a base office set up outside of the US and be able to start providing services to the world 
starting outside of the US and then enter the US later, as you saw with Binance.us, FTX.us, mm. Bitstamp.us. But Kraken, for example, was a native US-based company. They had operated and established in the US from the beginning. So when you ask the question of what's going to happen, I think what's going to happen is you will see a lot of these native players who are strong at what they do and who really believe in pushing the industry forward. They're going to establish bases in the US. And that's how the true competition begins, right? When you, when you follow that path of being fully compliant, fully regulated, and you actually operate the technology behind it really well, people will recognize that. Banks will start using those technologies as well because they can't build these things in-house. We've already seen that, right? With the FinTech revolution, Chase app, Citigroup changed their app. I was at Citi when they were closing down all of their branches in the East Coast. And so I realized very quickly, banks just move so slowly, it's impossible. You know, They tried building an incubator in-house. They tried to build these sort of like startup environment, that's culture where people would walk in and flip flops and t-shirts. That's not what drives <laughs> the innovation, right? What drives the innovation forward is the actual technology. And if you're borrowing that technology, it's much easier to build on top of it. So when you think about, you know, the players in the industry, Chainlink Labs, Aave, all of these players, they've all tried to kind of push forward the idea that you can do some of these things that the traditional banks and financial services companies do such as lending, such as providing credit, such as providing options for earning yield, much easily, much more easily on a decentralized network. And so I foresee that the industry that exists today will exist in its shape and form. You will start to see some of these ancillary services start to come down in terms of scope and reach. And you will start those, you'll see those services starting to build on top of the decentralized blockchain network. So then there's going to be synergies. And that's what we really want. What we really want them to understand is you don't have to build everything on your own. There's this technology now that can allow you to tap into the potential and you can reach many more people just by using those technologies. So I feel like there is going to be a world where we'll be working together, but they'll do what they are good at, what they've always been good at, which is operating you know, within that core product, net, you know, core set of products. And we will actually build the technologies that they have not been able to build yet and they'll start using those and that's when the mass adoption happens it's it's kind of like building up like this uh this idea of fomo for the banks like all the innovation all the cool things are happening in crypto and it's like oh like, i really want to be a part of that like i should be there so i think that's you're right like the technology drives that and it drives like the innovation just attracts people it's just how fast they can really move they're, they're just yeah. like held down. I mean, the other, the other aspect is, you know, when you think about like public versus private companies, I actually started my career as a software engineer at Fidelity Investments. You guys know now, Fidelity is much more advanced and far ahead in terms of adoption. They already built their institutional you know, platform. They're already offering their services to their retail clients now. To, to the effect that, you know, the, the U.S. government is putting pressure on them and saying, look, you guys should think about this again. But how did, how did Fidelity get there? Because Fidelity isn't listed on any exchange. It's, it's not a public company. It's actually a privately run, family-owned business. You know, Ned Johnson, who was the, the CEO and the, the founder, when he died, his, his daughter took over, um, Abby Johnson, and they've run that, that whole business. They're the biggest mutual funds company in the world. They have, you know, trillions of dollars in assets. Why would they get involved so early? And remember, when they actually announced, they had already been building those services for years. So Fidelity being that far ahead of their own competition on Wall Street, mm -hmm. that's a sign. That just means that companies who are private, who don't have to answer to their shareholders, they're actually farther ahead in terms of innovating. And I think that's what you will try to, you, you, you'll tend to see a lot of these companies that are building today become the leaders in the future. You know, not saying that Fidelity is going to be one of them, but the fact that they are so deeply involved and they're being looked at from the regulators and the government now in terms of what are you doing and what are you offering to your customers? It just shows that Fidelity was in it from the beginning. They have been there. So I'm proud of the fact that that's where my career started. And it's kind of like coming a full circle where you can see that's the company that's been the most innovative in traditional financial services. So there's no reason to doubt that, you know, crypto is here to stay. 
all of these events in the past few months or the past one year, this has all happened in different shapes and forms before, right? 2017, 2014, with the Mongogs collapse. This stuff is all driven by human, basic human emotions, right? Power, greed, ego. When that comes to, to be the driving force, which as you guys must have seen in, in the deal book uh, summit, when Sam bankman fried was asked the question by Andrew Ross Sarkin, and he goes, yeah, like, I, I didn't know. I, I didn't do my job. But but then you, you then you have to ask the question that what were you doing there, right? Like <laughs> w- was it was it just a party in Bahamas? Because when you think about it, FTX's app and their platform actually had something. They they did build a product which was being used by millions of customers. Why else would have customers park their funds on it? Mm-hmm. So you know you you build something and then you become so proud of it or you become so you know power hungry. If you start going to, you know, CFTC and you start asking them to regulate based on your wishes and needs and you start putting that money that you should not be touching into things that, you know, you feel like you can you can apply pressure to the government. You can actually lobby some of these uh, politicians. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's been the story. That's the age old story. That's how the 2008 financial crisis happened. Um, And and we, we would not have seen the last of it. We'll see many more such situations come up. But but have you guys noticed, this is something that I was thinking about the other day. Every time Bitcoin goes through this, this bull run or crypto in general goes through this bull run cycle, none of these things come up, right? None of these issues come up. Everybody is happy. Everything is great. And then as soon as the markets start coming down, all of these little things start coming up. And, mm-hmm. you know, like, do you, do you really feel like, Binance announcing that they'll sell the FTT tokens back, you know, last year would not have driven something like this. That's speculation, right? You may you may want to believe that it wouldn't have happened, but it still could have happened. So I I I, I honestly think that you know it's good that these things happen during bear markets mm-hmm. because companies like us, like Matter Labs, we're we're focused on building. We were building through the bull run. We'll continue building through the bear market, and when the next bull run happens will be in a much better position. Exactly. I think it, it sometimes a little bit corny, but I, I hear the term like it's it's a build a market, not a, a bear market. And I really like seeing that from 2018, like that when you live through that, you like really believe in that. Of like, it's not fun financially for everybody, but I really think this like boils down and shows like the true players and it brings out that innovation uh, of making people like, focus in on the technology instead of like, oh, I can just put a smart contract out there and then I'll have 3 million TVL overnight. Like it just, it, it's it's cool to see like the, the focus during a, a bear market. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing that I've learned from this whole experience is every time this happens, right? The, the fact that this is happening, people kind of believe that this happens more in the crypto industry. That's also not true. Right. Because this happens on Wall Street all the time. I was there. I've seen it happen. You guys have seen how many fines have been applied to, you know, Deutsche Bank, Wells Fargo, like all of these big banks go through the same set of problems. The only difference is because they are fully regulated, because they are behind all of these walled gardens, generally the common man doesn't see what's going on. And that's by design. Right. That's why regulation exists. That's why compliance exists. Anything that's going on inside will remain inside. And so the difference here is because we are a self-regulated industry today, more or less, you will see exactly what's going on. It's all there. It's like hanging out your dirty laundry to dry for everybody to see. And that's what happens in crypto. And unfortunately, people see what's happening and they believe that this is more prevalent in this industry when it's totally not the case. There was... um. I think it was a, a meme or a quote on, on Twitter about, uh, about that situation, I felt. It was, uh, I think they were saying that if entities, exchanges, or institutions fail to, to, to adopt the appropriate risk management strategies, the market will take care for them of that. Um, and I think this uh, summarized very well uh, what, what you said. Like, um, these have happened in the classical institution. Sometimes there was regulation compliance to protect the consumers. But in crypto, we are yeah mostly self-regulated. There is very little of that. And indeed, the market can be brutal 
uh, for for people that fail to <laughs> to put this, uh, the safeguards such as uh, FTX. I mean, I think not only failing to do proper risk management, but also perhaps willingly, um, uh, yeah, failing to do so or willingly uh, committing fraud. I don't know. Here it's only speculation. We uh, we will have to 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 wait a bit. Uh, how the story unfolds, but yeah, um, we we are subject to the market forces at uh, I'd say at a stronger uh, with stronger strength. And I think the other like the one one last thing I will add on this note, and then you know we can we can move on to another topic. But one thing I will say is there is something to do with you know experience, right? Like I am not an ageist person, but when you think about all of these things that have happened. I was part of like a, a Telegram group or a Discord group, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. And this guy was, uh, you know, when BitMEX was just taking off and everybody was trying to do margin trading on BitMEX, this guy was posting results of like, you know, 1000%, 1200% returns. And then actual people in the group, which, you know, I knew, I knew some of those people, people who were in high positions, doctors, engineers, finance professionals, even. Um, at companies, you know, that are fintech, they were sending this person this money in Bitcoin. So they were transferring Bitcoins to this guy and he was running this fund. But, but you know, these are all people like us. Like there are people who have, you know, saved their money over their lifetimes and they have a lot of, you know, um, interest in crypto and they're sending something online to an anonymous person who has like, you know, a name on it. And they believe that they're going to be, able to make these kinds of returns. And this person is doing that out of the goodness of his heart. I mean, yes, of course he's earning fees and all of those things, but setting up a fund online, having no paperwork behind it, having no sort of, you know, signs, signatures on who is sending what, how does that make sense, right? And, and yet people fell for it. And actually this, this, was, this was a big case um, later on where the US Southern District of New York SDNY, they actually prosecuted this case along with IRS. They finally caught this guy in Long Island. And guess what? He was a 26 year old kid, 26. And, <laughs> and he, he dropped out of NYU to start this thing in crypto. And his entire operation was a Ponzi scheme, taking money from people. And then when the payout time came along, when somebody requested a payout, he would basically take those funds and pay them. And people then would talk with each other and they would say, oh, yeah, I actually did get like, you know, 100% return on my investment. I got some of those back. So then more people would come in, more people would take out. And then finally, you know, the music stopped. And that's when <laughs> that's when people realized what was going on. So I also feel like there is, I mean, Sam Bankman Freed, Caroline Ellison, like all of these people running Alameda and FTX. How are these people or like, you know, all under 30 folks and, and running such big operations with basically zero experience, just being able to say they worked on, you know, Wall Street for a couple of years. So I do think this industry allows and welcomes more people, right? And that's not the case with traditional financial services. You have to go and you have to study and you have to get your license and you have to prove that you can actually do trading. That's why you have to get the license. And then you go through like years and years of proving yourself, right? Late nights, running around, giving coffee to your boss, like all of that is part of like building uh, a conscience, building a personality, building a, a, a way to look at things and say, you know, good things don't come easy. You have to work for it. So I, I do feel like that argument about young people getting involved in this space without actually having the experience or knowledge and, and then getting involved with the reason of getting rich quick is the reason behind some of these things happening. But we have many more people who have actually been in the industry, they have gained that experience and many more people who are coming into the industry with the traditional experience. Um, and I think that's where, that's where the maturity will come. I think the, the industry is going to mature overall. Yeah. Couldn't have said, said it better. <laughs> um, and so I would love to keep going on that conversation. Uh, we do have a time limit on Zoom. Yes. Um, and we have some, we have two great questions in our chat. So we have about uh, six minutes. Uh, feel free to take your time on the answers. It'll just cut. So sure. if anybody is on, we'll just say our goodbyes now. And, and, and by the way, if you guys, if you guys need to cover anything else, I can drop off too. And you no, guys no, no, no. Just the last few minutes. This is, 
This is way cooler. This is way <laughs> more fun. <laughs> we can so the other stuff later. <laughs> I'm, I'm just glad to be talking to the community. I've been hearing yeah. so many things. Good. Uh, so Dimasia, uh, for one of our uh, one of our community mods, uh, asked in the chat uh, and is really excited to have you join the team. Um, he said, Do, uh, "Don't you think if the crypto market gets regulated, we'll have just another SP and or SP and five hundred, uh, but in crypto?" And then follow up. Then what is the added value except for technology? Yeah, so that's the question we have to ask ourselves, right? Do we want to be regulated? Because if we are regulated, at least to a certain extent, then we become legitimate. Then people don't look at us and say, oh, you know, what are you guys doing? Like, are you guys going to be, you know, doing the same things that happened with Mt. Gox and FTX? So some amount of regulation is good. Over-regulation is bad, right? I mean, in 2008, when the banks collapsed, there was more regulation that came in, right? That was the genesis of the Dodd-Frank Act and they applied a lot of more strict measures on the banks. Did that actually stop banks from, you know, not committing fraud, but fraud happening on their platforms or people sending money to countries where they shouldn't be sending it to or sponsoring, you know, violence and arms and buying, you know, those things? It doesn't, right? So over-regulation, is only going to drive people to find ways to get around it. So I do think some amount of regulation is good, but that doesn't take away from what we're building, right? I mean, at the core of the, the technology is the ethos, the people um, on the Ethereum ecosystem, they know that this is going to be the future of crypto. They know why we're building. We're, we, we, are, we are building because we're trying to create that, that new city, right? Like this whole ZK Sync ecosystem for me is like building that, virtual city where like we'll have all of these different ecosystem players come in and build on top of it so then we kind of have like this separate world view of things and how we operate but the actual the real world the way things are working in the traditional financial services that's not going away nor is the nor should the goal be to get them out of business to get them to disappear i think the goal should be to show them that the city that we're building using ZK Sync as an example. I was actually talking to the CEO of Liquify yesterday. Liquify is building the Carta of tokens, right? Um, they have already implemented on ZK Sync. So in our conversation, this is what I realized. I realized, you know, you have more companies like Liquify build in this city that we have, we have created. And now suddenly you realize everything can happen within that city. You don't need a lot of these traditional systems and that's okay as long as the traditional systems don't try to block us from doing that. So some amount of regulation will actually help us not be blocked or not be seen as adversaries where they try to sabotage what we're building, but they'll then see us growing and they'll realize, hmm, maybe we should have done this before and we didn't. So that's okay. They can join us. You know, They can plug into that city and, and get what they need from us. But we're going to be showing them a proof of what, what it could look like. Awesome. Perfect. Uh, okay, we've got about three minutes left. Um, we have uh, Sorios, uh, who makes just a quick shout out, makes really cool little robot videos, uh, put one out recently. I didn't get to comment on Twitter, but thank you for all that you do for us, Sorios. It's really cool. Uh, their question is, Encore, uh, do you feel that you have a huge competitive advantage and would you be happy if worthy competitors appear in the near future or are you, f or are you far ahead? I think we have a competitive advantage as far as the ZK Sync technology, right? I mean, the goal that Alex and, and Steve have right now is to basically get to that point where we are competing with the big players. But from a technology perspective, we are way ahead. We are, we are so far ahead of the competition. I don't think, you know, we have that issue of competing. I think we have to focus now on building through the bear market in a way that we're building conservatively that we don't exhaust all our resources, that we don't go crazy like FTX did, but we also focus on what is fundamentally the most important thing for us, right? I mean, if, if there is a token launch that is important for us next year, that's what we're gonna focus on. But we have to always know what is that going to drive, right? Just because Polygon has a token, just because you know some of these other competitors have it, that shouldn't be the only reason. There should be a reason behind driving our ecosystem forward, providing them the platform they need and I think that's my focus right now as the CFO is to find out ways that make most sense for us, but also thinking in the future, 
of what could that regulation and compliance standards look like, right? And not build in a way that we are rushing to get somewhere. And now we have these issues we didn't think about. So yeah, I think we have a competitive advantage for sure. Thank you. Um, I think we have about one minute left uh, before the Zoom shuts down. Um, I wanted to take that last minute to thank you. Thank you very much for for uh, answering all these questions. That that has been fascinating uh, for us, and I hope the community also enjoyed. From the messages that I see here on YouTube as well, they um, they find your background very interesting and your insights very, very uh, insightful and um, for, about the market and crypto. So before we cut, I just want to say thank you very much, Hancor, for for being here for answering the question from us in the community. Thank to you to the community. Happy weekend. Thank you very much for tuning in for that ZK Sing Weekly Rollup. Um, it's most likely going to cut in the next few seconds. But um, but again, thank you everyone for, for joining this, this call. And we're looking forward to seeing you all uh, next uh, week. Thank you for having me, guys. It was, an, it was an awesome opportunity. Happy to come back again. Thank you very much, Encore. Take care. Bye. Bye, all. And we're probably going to lose it. So everybody have a great Friday. <laughs> Happy Friday, everyone. <laughs>